his home village is another world inside a world. Homeless youth come to this area because this is what we know as safe zone. This is where we socialize, we make some mangoes. By the summer, I'm definitely going to be in house. I can feel that. The police make it seem like they're going to stop prostitution. They're homeless, so they, you know, they turn into this lifestyle. Officer, you want to search me? They just don't like it. Ma, all I'm asking you to do is just see me. That's it. I don't know her as Krista. This is my nephew. What's wrong with taking this lifestyle, setting it outside your mother's door? I'm tired of doing that. You walk with our hands up. Hi, I'm Mike Doherty, the director of programming of Outfest. Thank you for joining us for this live Q&A with the team behind the feature documentary, Peer Kids. We're so glad that we've been able to share Peer Kids with you through United in Pride, our showcase of LGBTQ short and feature films presented in partnership with The Hollywood Reporter, Billboard, and Film Independent. If you haven't been able to watch Peer Kids yet over the past week, you have about six hours more to do so after this Q&A is over. Go to unitedandpridefest.com and watch. Uh, Peer Kids made its world premiere with Outfest last summer, and it's had a tremendous life on the festival circuit. It's a raw and sensitively made portrait of the community of Black, queer, and trans youth who participated in this film, and it urgently speaks to the issues at the forefront of our current national conversation. To lead the discussion with the film's team, I'd like to welcome an Outfest alum, one of the stars of the 2016 documentary Kiki, which exists in a similar world as Peer Kids. Please welcome Gia Love. Hi, thank, you, thank you, Mike, for having me. I'm really excited to be here today and to share space with other documentaries. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us, Gia. With that, I'm going to pass the microphone to you and let us get to it. Thank you. So, you know, it was it's a great experience for me to be able to come back and you know, have a conversation with uh, my fellow documentarians, people who have been featured in documentaries. And before I do that, I just wanna talk about and highlight the fact that this is a true community-led conversation. I am also a peer kid. I have also been observed some of these people and through their stories and, you know, the most, profound thing for me after watching this documentary was actually knowing these people better. I didn't know a lot of these people was going through the things they were going through, and I can't wait to ask them questions. So I would like to introduce to you the director of the documentary, Elegant Brayton, and also the producer of the documentary, Chester Gordon. And I'm so happy to introduce the principals cast members of the documentary, without them and without their stories, we will not have such a beautiful uh, piece of art to share with the world. So Jeremy Conyers, Christu LaBeja Conyers, overall princess of the House of LaBeja, and Danielle Carter, welcome to this conversation this evening. So, like, I just want to start the conversation with Elegance and Chester. And I would specifically speak to, like, what inspired you to create this film. Um, but I want, if you can, I would like, because I know we spoke about this before, like, how did your personal life inspire you to create this beautiful film? Okay, um, we cannot hear you. So, so I'm just gonna go to the members while we fix the audio issues with Elegant. One of the most, um, like, you know, when I was in the Kiki documentary, we talked about my transition and I really empathized with Kiki's uh, experience with her family. Uh, so Christy, how are you doing today? And how is your family today? And what's the state of your relationship? Because I feel like this documentary took place a long time ago. And a lot of the 
people watching want to know, how are you? Well, thank you for asking. That's sometimes a question that we never get to, you know, get to a lot of times when I do Q and A's. So when it comes to my family, um, we do watch parties. We watch. I go to church pretty much virtually with them every Sunday and Wednesday. My mom and I, through my nieces and nephews' love, have you know come to a better space. Um, you know, like she uses proper pronouns now. Um, and, and again, I think it it came a lot when she approved of my husband in D.C. Um, and then she also seen how my nieces and nephews gravitated to me and it's like you can't mispronoun me and ruin another generation's perception of me so i think that kind of made it much easier not my daughter and stuff so it's awful <laughs> so um this question is open to any of the subjects of documentary um what was the most powerful piece of the film that stood out to you it be it your own personal experiences or the experiences of other characters within the film? Crystal, anyone else? Oh, wow. Oh, well, well, for me, I think the most powerful moment was when, um, there's, there's several. But I think the biggest moment was what you mentioned before, being able to actually see my parents and actually show the world that I wasn't technically crazy when people were wondering the dichotomy of why I waited so long to transition. You know, black market wasn't an option for me. Um, getting, and also just coming to a place of knowing who I am because of the type of um, rhetoric that they would pass off as religious. St uh, statutes and moral compasses. Um, I still maintain a lot of those moral compasses, but I'm more focused on the spirit that dwells within me, not the fleshly things. It's just I want people to recognize my uh, spirit by my flesh, and that's why I did the things I did to my flesh, so that people don't mistake what my spirit reads. Um, so that after I got to the comfortability of that, it was like, okay, cool. So I think that was the biggest thing, being able to approach that and show the world my perception and my struggle growing up all the time. So how long were you guys filming this documentary? Can, can you hear me now, Gia? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, great. So I wanted to answer your question that you asked about what inspired it in yeah. my personal life. Um, yeah. I was kicked out of my house when I was 16 for being gay. I'm from Northern Jersey. And, you know, I grew up when pretty poor we didn't have a lot of money so i grew up when you're poor and you're from northern jersey you get on the train and you go to new york and you go look at buildings so that's what i did and when i got on the train i saw three black gay men having the time of their life or at least i thought they were gay because they were being really loud and out and like just bodacious and fabulous and i was like wow i didn't even know you could be that gay in public where are they going and they led me to the pier so fast forward 20 or so years after I um, started college. And at the end of the first semester at my school, I saw all these kids going home and it, I went to Columbia University. So it's a big deal. You know, parents show up with pets and stuffed animals and streamers and the whole nine to see their kids off. And I'm like, where, am I, where are people waiting for me to come home at? Where are people most excited to see me? And I kind of looked up one day and I was on the pier and I was like, oh, wow, okay, this is home. Home is the place where one is most deeply understood. So I began making the film from that spirit of like talking to other people who felt at home in this space and trying to understand why we felt at home in this space and what made us a family, even though we may not have all known each other's names or even really necessarily been friends with each other, yet somehow we were all family. And I met Crystal about a month after I started shooting and we continued shooting for five years from 2011 to 2016. Mm -hmm. So uh, these, each character, um, each subject on this panel has a very dynamic story. Uh, and I think it, like for me, I was just thinking about what we were experiencing back then and what we, the conditions that we are in now. 
Um, why did you choose these very special people? Um, each one of them has a different kind of thing. I'll start with uh, Deshaun. Deshaun just reminded me of myself when I was 19. I was really, really smart, and I didn't have a lot of opportunities in life to be able to turn that intelligence into something kind of sustaining economically. So when I met Deshaun, and I, I kind of called him the mayor of Christopher Street, it seemed like he knew everybody, and everybody really, really respected him. And I felt like every time I talked to him, I walk away understanding more about myself and more about this space. Um, with Casper, Casper was a real light in this world. He was a really, really sweet and gentle soul. And that always surprised me because of how hard he'd come up, you know, foster care and being you know, exiled from his family because he chose to love black trans women out loud. And so yet somehow he always had this warmth and it kind of reminded me of my own innocence. And for Crystal, I mean, Crystal is a, I, I think she's a philosopher. I think Crystal could write books about spirituality and, and how to, I, I was just impressed with how she maintained her spiritual core in the midst of all of this turmoil that was being thrown her way. And I felt like she was a mother and I missed my mom terribly and she missed her mom terribly. So I just bonded with her over that. And the more we talked, the more we became friends, the more I was like, okay, now that you're my friend, I, I have to make sure everybody knows you the way I know you, why, why I'm friends with you. So one of the most interesting pieces of this film to me was that I was able to see, even though I come, from, I'm a product of the pair as well. I was able to see the different intersections of like the pair and also my experiences and just like the different stories that we all share. Um, I want to know about what was and and basically what I and let me go back. Let's back. To me. So basically, it tells the story of like some of the most marginalized people that you will experience in this country. And oftentimes, these people are viewed as disposable. How did you, how did you support, get the support, get the backing to create such a film? Because I just want to say, I remember you recording this film and you did it so in an unwavering way. You were so ambitious about getting this done. And what was the support behind you, even through all the adversity that you had to face along the process? It was, wow, what a great question. Um, I, first off, the people themselves, I felt like I was witnessing gentrification at the final stage and the erasure of a meaningful and important black culture that you can at least say from Stonewall is where, it, at, you know, from Stonewall is where it starts to appear in the mass consciousness. And it continued for 50, almost 50 years at that point, unabated until the New York City Police Department decided to get super aggressive and start locking the pier down and, you know, at times beating people up, chasing people out. So on that note, I, nobody had ever talked about the contributions that queer Black people have made to that space. And I think it was important to talk about. And then on the other level, it was the people themselves, Crystal, Daniela, um, Jeremy, Deshaun, Anaya, Cheetah, you know, at a certain point, people started to die in this film. And I felt like I have to finish this. I can't allow people to give so much of their heart and spirit to me for this, just for the sake of being understood so that people could hear their story and see that there was more to them than just being out there all night, that they were actually doing, you know, good work out there, like social work with one another. And then finally, my own mother, um, I had a really chaotic and difficult childhood as a result of not just my sexuality, but just kind of like the weight of white supremacy in general on black women, uh, particularly poor black women whose imaginations are the reason why black people still exist in this hemisphere without whom, you know, we always give the credit to the Bill Cosby's and the, oh, not Bill Cosby anymore, I take that back. But, um, you know, we give credit to these, to these kind of civil rights heroes and like the Beyonce's of the world, but we don't take a lot of time to acknowledge the contributions of poor black women, of black trans women. And I wanted to make something that could help a woman like my mother understand my culture a bit more. 
so that that woman wouldn't throw her kids out the way mine did. So this question is to the cast. So one of the, like, as a black trans woman um, who I felt like growing up that like I had a story to tell and I didn't know if I was gonna have a, have the opportunity or the platform to tell my story, I am very thankful for Kiki because I will never be forgotten. And I think the same of all of the subjects of this film, you will never be forgotten even outside of you know just this film, your legacy will live on forever. Uh, what does this film mean to you in terms of your legacy and how it how how do you feel about the way the film portrayed you? I think we're having audio issues because only okay. Christian can speak is the No, I mean I always know what I've been doing is trying to make sure that I'm making space um to see if you wanted to respond first. But something for me, I think that has been interesting, like just watching the film as well as my relationship with Elegance, Crystal, Jeremy, Deshaun, you, right? It's like, I look back at that time and I reflect on a moment of me trying to find my place in the world, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think about how so many young people who we felt in a way galvanized at the peers, right? Like there was always that calling, right? Of the rejected, of what the abandoned looked like. And we created this place of community. And it's always good to know that like, while there's so much work to be done on the ground level, right? Like, but narratives like this remind us about how much change has occurred, right? So we noticed simply pushing forward because I think back, you know, if it wasn't for Crystal being a person to be like a mentor for me, right? Like, and she, like push me to be who I am, I think about how different my life could have been, right? Like, how would I have known that it was okay to be trans as a child, you know, to even become an adult without someone like Crystal? And I think that we need narratives that allows trans people to see not only engaging with other trans people is okay, but as well as seeing narratives of trans women being uplifted by an entire community of blackness and not always having to depend right on a system of white power. So to me, I'm thankful that not only did he give voice to the marginalized experience, but he created platforms and gave voice right to the people who now need to be seen such as pursue Deshaun and all the other subjects. So I'm grateful because it reminds me of what the future looks like. For me, it was like, um, I, I, when I first began the film, um, I was without, I wasn't married. So to see the closing of the film kind of bring me through rough times and disparity and struggles to then close out me singing to my husband legally at that time in it. And then it I, I, honestly, that final scene was after he kind of like um, was by my bedside when I got rebor reborn again. So like that was a big thing. And then some of the moments like see a meeting with my daughter down at the nail shop, like those precious nuggets, it was like, even through the struggles and us not having AC or having to move from one place to the next, two bedroom to a studio, but my kids ain't gonna be on the street. It was like for us to, for an elegant still, them being gracious enough to not push elegance out and say, uh-uh, no, they are not gonna see me like this. For them to be that transparent and solid in their foundation to in their trust in the people that I bring around me to know that it would be done with care. I, honestly, I just, I'm thankful that the, that it, it helped. It's gonna help the next generation not be ashamed of the, what they have to go through, but still keep their eye, eyes on the prize because honestly, we all have to go through a test to get to a testimony. So yeah, I see triumph in it. Long story short. <laughs> so uh, Jeremy, would you like to answer this? Because I have a question specifically for you if you, Okay, so my question, my question specifically for you is that um, you said like some of the most powerful words for me in the film 
when you talked to Crystal and you said, um, we're gonna walk with our heads up high. And oftentimes, in my experience, I don't have many men in my life who hold me to that, you know, that who hold me accountable to stand in my truth, right? Most of the time, men want to dim my light to support their insecurities and their lack of acceptance with what they are in love with and who they're engaging in intimate relationships with. Um, so can you talk to those men and why, what, what it's like to be so powerful and so uh, unapologetic in your love for Crystal? <clears throat> Well, first of all, um, there's a lot of men out there, you know, that's, that's going through a lot of stuff in their mind. And, you know, being told that you're not a man and you're less than a man and you never add up to a being a man in so many different forms and ways. Um, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of strength, mm -hmm. inner strength. It takes mm -hmm. wanting to be better mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. And it takes knowing that I'm always going to be a man mm -hmm. and I'm always going to be more. Mm -hmm. And I'm never looking down at myself as lesser mm -hmm. for those guys out there you know, that want to take back, you know, who you are, you know, it starts from the inside. That's your walk. You know, they, they make movies like Walking Tall. That's how you walk tall. You know, there's a, it's a world of cancers. Mm -hmm. And the only thing you can do is cut it out bit by bit every day, mm. every step. So for those guys, those men out there, you know, that's been put down every day of their lives that you know, I can't say their lives, but every day in the time remaining that they still have on this earth. Um, just keep walking, you know, tall. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for that. So tall. in the midst of uh, a global pandemic, there was an image circulating of the pair and there was a bunch of white folks on the pair and they didn't have masks on and the pair looked very, very different. One of the things I said earlier that I liked about this film is it really touched on the interest, like the village was a microcosm of the world, like everything, we've seen everything there. Like the racist guy that was like in the film, like, you know, it, sitting with the girls, it was just like a, it was literally a space of acceptance. Can you speak to the gentrification that's going on and the anti-police violence? Uh, sure. I mean, the, the the police violence that has occur has has occurred historically in the sure. in that space. And um, what 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 should we be doing now? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say a quick uh, just a note: the people in my film are not subjects; they're participants because we made the movie together and without them choosing to participate with me and vice versa, we wouldn't be sitting here talking. So this subject, sometimes this word subject just feels so short. It feels like, like not enough to describe the people in these documentary films, especially my films. So I, I just wanna let everyone know, Crystal, Deshaun, Casper, Daniela, Jeremy, they're all participants in this film right along with me. Mm -hmm. um, and then speaking about the gentrification, you know, I've said this before and I'll, I think I'll say it again until I'm blue in the face until it changes, but gentrification is a code word for ethnic cleansing. And in 1969, two homeless trans women of color, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, a mother and a daughter, mind you, right? Chosen mother and daughter had enough of police brutality in 1969 that they enacted a riot that would give us the gay rights movement, gays in the military, gays getting married, so on and so forth. So when we, act, when we talk about police brutality on the pier, we must acknowledge that for at least 50 years, it's been so bad that a riot could happen every summer. 
um, because people, you know, the riot is the is the language of those who are unheard, right? And who are less heard than our trans brothers and sisters and our homeless uh, queer youth that are tossed aside like so much of yesterday's troubles. When you look at this film and you compare it to Paris is Burning in 1986 to 2011, you see a remarkable difference in the way that the public space is dealt with. There are, you know, for instance, there's that cafe that opened up where people used to sit and smoke blunts and they used to talk. And Crystal and I have probably done, I don't know, 15, 20 different interviews in that location. If I were to make the film Pure Kids today, we'd have to buy something from that restaurant in order to sit down in public space. So at every turn, they make it uncomfortable for us to be there. They make us feel spotlit when we are there. And once the spotlight is on us, then, the, then it gives the cops the reason, the excuse to come over and try to police our presence. It's not about sex work. It's not about the drugs that are being done. What it's about is that you are black, you are poor, and you are in an area that's been designated for rich white people. And as, as such, you are a problem. The moment you step off that one train at 7th Avenue and you walk down to the water, every time you take that walk, the police are looking at you as if you don't belong, that you are not allowed to breathe the same air as the people who can afford to be here. And as a result, it puts all of us under pressure. People fight, people get angry, people cry, people kill themselves, all because they've been made to feel as though they don't belong in a space that their ancestors fought for them to be in. Can I say something to that too? Please. Um, so, you know, like, I think, like, where I'm at now in life, I do say many days, like, I'm in awe of it because I think about where my journey started, right? And so much of that, like, the only way I could envision my life was through, like, the water the, and the peers, right? Like, it was like seeing people who had access made me see something beyond my own community. Right, so I was starting to move outside of this mind of contentment, thinking that I can only exist in this community that rejects me, push me to a community that I can't afford to live in. But if anything, it fueled me to believe that you have to obtain this. And by any means necessary, you're gonna do that. And I think that being able to access the peers as a place of safety until being able to build what that bridge would look like for me, or that pathway better better way to say it and you know it's kind of scary a bit now and i'm not trying to be funny but it's like i think about how much the kid saved me and you know where do a kid go to get i don't know like for anybody else here on that this call but i remember for me personally when it rained outside i could go to the red door or to the boathouse to go to sleep you know what I mean? That's no longer her there. That's a yacht club or some, you know, some exclusive club down on the pier. You know, when I think about the red door that was like right across the street from the piers, it was something that when I was introduced to it, you go through a back door, and I mean literally no exaggeration, about 20 youth were living in it, and that was our safe space. Now, I'm not saying that, right, that we should be trespassing, right? Like, of course, there should be programs. But I think about that kid who doesn't know about that. And whose pathway is Christopher Street to with, I guess, the beginning of being liberated and living in their truth as a prayer person is, right? Especially a minority queer, right? Like, we don't go to our white, like, we don't have coming out parties. We have homelessness parties, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so, no. <laughs> no but that, You're right, I'm just... <laughs> You're you know, very right. That's what feels real. And then so when these kids who are experiencing homelessness at a higher rate, right, have, they don't have that community go to. When it comes to the trickle down of these nonprofits, they get no resources. I wonder, do we tell them to literally go jump in the water this time? Mm -hmm. Because for me as a person, at a time where I should have been taking this in the but it frees me, it frees me. To know that entire atmosphere is gone. I wonder what is this community doing to hold itself accountable to bring back our community as well as create resources that is tangible for you to access, right? Like not just the, the marketable right, resources that, oh, we're going to do this. 
is what are we going to do knowing now that this community is taken from them? We're not going to call it the Big Day Ice Cream and say, we'll sponsor events. We're going to need to figure out where we're going to house these kids because the pier is no longer a house. It's a white it's white people's territory to push us out. Sorry if that was wrong. And then, but that's really no, it's okay. when I look at the pier. I don't so. Yeah, no, yeah, it's okay. I when when I think about the pier, um, and gentrification, for me, I don't care how um, clean they make it, because at first it was them putting up the fence around the pier, so that there would be borders, because people would fall into it, um, or be attacked and cast it away like society thought they would be. And so they put a fence there. They cleaned up the rocks. We still stay. Then they put up the statues about a riot, but they only put white ones, not black ones, so that while we're down there, we don't see ourselves. Mm. We still stay. Mm. And then when I still mm -hmm. and then when I think about it, all the programs and all the funding that goes into the nonprofits that's right. They're not in Bronx or Brooklyn or or where the projects are. They're in Manhattan. And so when you want to know why we go to the pier, mm -hmm. it's because after five o'clock, when we get shut out of those good resources and all the most funded programs that are in Center City, we go to the place that's convenient for us to go to because if we can't make it up to the shelter that has limited spaces, we're now sleeping outside. So um, if we don't have crisis centers, because how many crisis emergency resources do we have for kids who are getting kicked out in the middle of the night? Because it, out of personal experience, people don't get kicked out in the middle of the day. So they're not running to a shelter before six o'clock. A lot of times they get kicked out later and they're trying to call a friend. And if they can't get a, uh, get a place to sleep, then that's when they need the assistance around 10 or 11. But most places will turn you away after seven. So you're always going to have this group of people dwelling down in gentrified pier. Because for us, that's always been a safe space. It will always be a safe space, whether or not you like it until you fix the problem. And that's right. And I, and I just want to piggyback real fast. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'll be super fast. But I just want to also say that, like this nonprofit, you asked what can we do differently. The nonprofit industrial complex that has gotten so rich out of HIV and AIDS needs to reallocate the funds that it raises towards rooting out systemic racism and white supremacy as it affects queer people of color. Mm -hmm. It is not enough to pass out condoms and prep. It is something, but it has never been enough. People need to learn how to read, they need to learn how to write, they need to be able to be fed, they need housing. Glitz, these black trans women I'm so proud of just bought a million dollars worth of homes off of an uh -huh. Instagram share. Uh -huh. And I'm looking at organizations like GMHC and I'm wondering what's good? Why haven't you bought a building for these kids in 25 years? That's all. So that is a great, like, Segue. Thank you for um, providing that because that's a great segue into my like final question. And um, my final question is around, it, it touches on equity. It touches on, um, it, it kind of comments on the language check and shift that you um, propose. These are participants. You guys all do amazing work. Um, you guys are you know, not only you're not you're not subjects. You are human beings to have lives, and I want the audience to know how they can support you. Where can they find you? How, what you are doing, and how they can support your work? Um, because there's a lot of influential people here. The Outfest has a lot of resources. Um, Hollywood Reporter and the other partners have a lot of money, and like you said, you know, it's time to be um, equitable and you know, connect people to the things that they need to be connected to. So please tell me what you do, how people can contact you and what you need to be supported so that you know, people can support you in doing that. Elegance, you could go first. Um, 
I'll go. I'll go first. I'll go first. Um, I am uh, Elegance Bratton uh, at Elegance Bratton on Instagram at Elegance Twenty One on Twitter. Uh, I have a lot of stuff coming. I'm working on a feature doc about the Harlem Hellfighters, historical black regiment of soldiers who brought jazz to France and brought black bodies to the U.S. Imperial Project of World War I. Um, I also am about to shoot my first fiction feature called The Inspection. I'll be shooting it this summer in the Deep South. Pray for me. Uh, I've got TV shows, a whole bunch of stuff coming. So if you follow me on Instagram, you follow me on Twitter, you will see. And if you really want to help me and you are an elite gay, you are a part of the Velvet Mafia, use your privilege to dismantle your privilege. Make access available to the people you walk by every day and do not just focus on your circle of friends. Daniela. Oh. Hi, my name is Daniela Carter. You can follow me on Instagram, Daniela period Carter. Um, I am currently a producer. Um, I am excited to share that um, after this, the video that we'll be showing is something that I was a creator and also a contributor to. Um, I currently work at a creative agency um, in New York City by the name of Special Guest. I am in the process of starting my own, um, not my own, but in partnership with Special Guest, a curated list where I'll be highlighting um, creators of color, licensing their work, um, and potentially moving towards hosting award ceremony and really beginning to foster work connections and um, relationships with, like, with major brands, production companies, and industry leaders. Um, I guess something else that I'm excited to say that I'm doing is that I'm actually moving towards producing a film on the injustices that Black and Brown trans people experience. And yeah, so that's where I'm at these days. And the ways you can support me. Um, I think the way that you can support me obviously is by connecting with me and learning the names of the people who are doing the work for one. Um, you can personally invest in me and the projects that I do by continuing to follow me in that journey as I'm building. Um, as well as, you know, being a producer and, and being a trans woman of color producer a lot of times comes with its own challenges. So I hope if you feel moved by my video, it's not something you just take and you know use it on your platform, but invest back into me so I can invest in my talent and other fellow creators so we can continue to do the work. And I'm willing to explore whatever that looks like for you. Um, so yeah, you can reach me either through Instagram or my email, daniellacarter at me.com. Thank you. And um, so me, Crystal Abasia, you can find me on all social media outlets. All you have to do is put forward slash Crystal Abasia and you'll find I. Um, <laughs> but when it comes down to it, uh, what I'm doing, I've done, G I have an organization, GHTV, where we provide support um, with other black uh, trans uh, people of trans experience who wants to have control of their narrative. Um, if they're trying to start a business, we kind of help them with entrepreneurial skills. I still work with Center for Anti-Violence Education with Pride Protectors, teaching uh, kids from ages 16 to 24, self-defense, and how to, um, you know, better self, uh, you know, self-advocate for themselves and also know the structures of change on the state, city, as well as the, uh, the federal level so that we can better protect ourselves for the generations to come, um, building, building the future advocates of tomorrow. Um, I will say what my future initiative and what if, since Gia did mention that we, ha we are in a platform where we can ask for things. Um, I think the biggest thing for, uh, that's a big passion for me is to start, I, I 
in St. Louis, there's a program called Habitat for Humanities, and they build a house for the homeless. Um, for me, it's more so like building tiny houses for my trans brothers and sisters who are in those rural places that can't get to big cities that has nonprofit organizations. So mm -hmm. teaching them agricultural importance, sustainable living, instead of teaching, taking the big cities to the rural, uh, to a retreat, why not t uh, go in the summertime and build tiny houses for those who can't make it to a big city and we can adequate for them um, and also teach them how to be sustainable and self-reliant on themselves because we have to build a stronger community nationwide and not just in the big cities. So if you know places that has property that we can start building these initiatives so we can put safe spaces in every zone, I do have a blueprint and we're just looking for a property to be able to start building these self-sustaining communities for the trans nationwide. And Ms. Gia, what are you working on before we get out of here? What are you working on, Gia? Uh, well, definitely. <laughs> yeah, if, if like you can just BTFA, the Black Trans Women in the Arts Collective is like something I'm really excited to be a part of. Um, you can find us on all platforms and you can donate to our cause and we just provide a safe space and we curate art and resources for Black Trans Women in the Arts. Um, thank you for giving me that space. Um, and um, I just want to say this, I am really, thank you so much for this film. It was definitely necessary in conversation with all the other films that have come out about people who have been on the pier. You guys inspired me so much. I was so happy oh, wow. to see you guys in other elements. I know everyone here. Thank you so much for this work. Continue to support the work. And I'll hand it back over to Daniela for her project. Amen. Thank you. Um, like, 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 hello, Daniela. Yeah, what did you tell us about it? What are, what are we about to watch, Daniela? Okay, so I have had the most amazing opportunity in the world to work with um, over forty trans identified individuals um, nationwide. And what I wanted to do, so basically I felt inspired to create this because I was invited to do a social media challenge called Don't Rush. For those of you who are familiar with it and those who aren't, it's a challenge basically that when the pandemic hit, it was like showing you like, kind of like in your house in your comfy clothes and then like, wow, your glamour's on. And it, and it reminded me, because this thing to me, right? Like, and I don't know if this comes up as big, but I'm told a lot of times like, that I'm very attractive. And it always makes me say, how can I turn that into privilege and access? How can I turn that pretty privilege into access or representation for people who may not feel included? And so I wanted to create a narrative that spoke to all trans people that doesn't say you have to fit this mold or conform right to this binary, and then you're 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 seen to be trans enough. So I hope this message that I'm sending to people is a reminder that. It is okay to be trans at any age, that in a time like this where we feel isolated, you are remembered, you are deserving, and that your voice is needed not just for me, but for the next person fighting to be seen. So thank you, Alfred. I'm really excited to share this with the world.